oral history project uh, interview with Derek A. Davenport on April 30th, uh, 2009, at his residence. Hello again. <laughs> Once again, <laughs> Once into the breach, dear friend. Indeed. It's uh, the risk of a twice told tale, but uh, our apologies. Um, Derek. Um, uh, of course, the purpose of the oral history project is to uh, to uh, if you record your reminiscences and uh, and uh, especially of Purdue, but uh, we'll start at the beginning if we can, um, where you were born and your early life, and your parents and your siblings. Well, to begin at the beginning, I was born on September the twenty third, nineteen twenty seven. Uh, the second son of Thomas Alfred Davenport and Maggie Davenport in the town of Leicester, which is in the English Midlands. Leicester is now almost a province of Pakistan, but back then uh, it was a quiet English manufacturing city of boots and shoes. But it did have one claim to glory, and that the origins of the parliamentary system trace back to a meeting uh, in Leicester in the 13th century. I thought that was the Magna Carta, but I, I, was, wrong. I, um, I was wrong. <laughs> I spent the, the first nine years of my life in Leicester going to the village school with its little bell tower and then uh, when the village school uh, more or less ran out of relevant material uh, we moved across Leicester to live on what was called Plantation Avenue. Uh, the In name was given because they yes. were all bungalows there. <laughs> And I went to a local school called Granby Road, a um, middle school, I suppose you'd call it in American terms, which was straight out of Charles Dickens' uh, Death of His Halls. Nonetheless, a very good grounding was given there. It was uh, a school, I was lucky in my schools, and uh, Granby Road was, was one of the best. Uh, in 1936, my father moved to a new job in London, and my brother and I, we now had a younger brother, Peter, but he was still young to go to school, moved to London, where I received all the remaining part of my education. Initially at Stationers Companies School, mm -hmm. which was a outgrowth of the medieval guild of stationers, uh, best remembered nowadays for the fact that all books published in English at that time had to be registered at Stationers Hall and uh, particularly important in the case of the plays of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Guild Hall uh, survived until it got banged around during the Blitz. I believe it has now been uh, re renovated, but I've not seen it um, since World War II, so uh, a long time ago. Mm. Stationers Company School, again, was an excellent school, but uh, I started off in the prep school, uh, which was run by the, the same faculty who also taught in the main school. And it was not until 1938 that I entered into uh, the regular curriculum of Stationers School. I 
after a year of this, which included the usual English and uh, health, I think we called it, <laughs> uh, beginning French, mathematics, uh, World War Two broke out and we were evacuated from London to a small town in Cambridgeshire called Wisbeach. And we shared school facilities with Wisbeach Grammar School. Um, they went in the morning and we went in the afternoon. Hmm. The whole family? No, just uh, my brother, my older brother oh. and myself. Uh, my parents stayed in London because mm -hmm. my father's job was centered there. Mm -hmm. And then I, the education basically started. In particular, and relevant to this interview, that's where I had my first chemistry lesson. Oh yes, okay. I was in the so-called second form and uh, I still remember very clearly what happened at that first lesson because the teacher wrote on the blackboard chemistry spelt the usual way and no mystery spelt with a Y <laughs> and he then prepared oxygen by heating mercuric oxide in a test tube. Mm -hmm. No worries about toxicology in those days. And he demonstrated that the gas that was produced, which of course we couldn't see, reignited a glowing spit and told us its name was oxygen mm -hmm. or acid former. And then he added an aside, which a good teacher will do. He said there's only one other common gas which reignites a glowing spit and that is nitrous oxide or laughing gas. Really? And I wrote it down in my notebook. And I've never forgotten that <laughs> totally useless fact that nitrous oxide will reignite a glowing splint. Uh, at the same time, uh, we had to decide for my second language whether it would be German or Latin. And the headmaster was determined that I was going to be an art student and not a science. You had leanings towards, uh, towards the arts too, huh? So he, uh, he insisted I take Latin, uh -huh. which at England then was definitely necessary if you were studying in the arts. I wish he'd uh, allowed me to take German because it would have been more useful. Anyway, the uh, education proceeded at Station of School, which was located in North London. And uh, the war, of course, changed things considerably because uh, many of the younger faculty members were conscripted into the army mm -hmm. or services generally. But it so happened that the chemistry teacher was blind in one eye as a result of a lab accident. And so he was relatively young, but not mm -hmm. unconscripted. Mm -hmm. And he was a good teacher. Watney, W-A-T Nash. Like Watney's Ale? Uh, that's why we called him Watney, yes. Okay. Um, and uh, he, he taught chemistry. The physics teacher was no, nowhere near as inspirational. His name was Baxendale. Mm. And the other teachers, particularly the English teacher, who wrote on the side for the West End Theatre, was obviously a great hero of mine. But the real hero was the teacher of geography. Ah. And he was called David Morgan Price Jones. And he was a strapping six foot four and had played rugby for Wales. Obviously, a uh, perfect example of a schoolboy hero. Mm. Furthermore, I liked geography. And I think if he had not been 
drafted into the RAF, promoted to squadron leader, and killed in action mm. over Cologne, mm. I might well have ended up majoring in geography and uh, being located in UNESCO in Paris. <laughs> but it was not to be. Uh, he disappeared. His success as a teacher of geography hadn't played rugby for Wales. Mm. And so uh, my attention then drifted to English and chemistry. Mm -hmm. The system was that when you had reached the age of about 15 or 15 or 16, I was a little young for my class level. You took the general school certificate which was an external exam set by various universities, in my case, the University of London. Uh, you took nine subjects, and uh, they were the fairly obvious subjects, including chemistry, physics, and French, and Latin, uh, and uh, alas, not geography. Mm. I passed with uh, reasonable distinction and then followed the normal English course of staying on for what was called sixth form work. Okay. And sixth form work you concentrated on either the sciences or the arts. Ah. And I chose chemistry mm -hmm. and physics. Mathematics and Applied Mathematics. And for two years I, I studied these various subjects. And then sat for the high school certificate and passed all four, uh, being reasonably distinguished in chemistry and physics, mm -hmm. and somewhat less distinguished in mathematics. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, it, it, it was not a marginal pass. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, although my, no, no, nobody in my family had ever been to college, um, it was suggested that I consider applying for university. Uh, the trouble was it was 1945. The war had ended in Europe, though not quite yet in Japan. And um, the, the colleges were swamped with demobbed servicemen mm -hmm. whose education had been interrupted by the war mm -hmm. who were coming back and fairly naturally they were given preference. Mm -hmm. And I was told there was no place for me in the university. Uh, furthermore, I was told that I was still uh, eligible for military uh, for national service, no longer military, uh -huh. and I should uh, be prepared to serve in the coal mines. You mean digging coal? Digging coal in the coal mines, <laughs> yes. Hmm. Uh, so I accepted it. I had no choice. It was... Uh, uh, yes. I had the letter from the Home Secretary, Herbert Morrison, to prove it. So I went on... Uh, up to visit my relatives in Manchester. When I got, I think, the first telephone call that was ever addressed to me, and it was to uh, report to University College London because one place had become available. Uh -huh. Their quota was 30. And one place had become available, and they were interviewing to fill it. So I went to the interview I don't know how many other people were also invited, uh, but I imagine several others because when I got there, virtually the whole faculty was sitting in the seats in the lecture hall, including Hughes and Ingold and Henry Terry and Sugden. Some fairly significant names in chemistry. Fairly significant names, mm -hmm. particularly Ingold. Mm -hmm. And I was interviewed. I have no idea what they asked me. But anyway, I was, as usual, fairly glib and uh, was chosen.
Thanks to the success so, of Latin. So uh, the coal mines had to manage without me. Mm. And I became a, what we I would later note uh, be as a freshman, a first year student mm -hmm. at University College, the godless collar of Gow Street <laughs> in 1945. Now, had you been uh, interested at, uh, in um, in going to university college, or was there? Well, I think I'd work? applied for a couple of colleges. Uh -huh. I didn't apply to Oxford or Cambridge. Uh -huh. and my, no, nobody in my family had ever, ever been to college. In mm -hmm. fact, neither neither of my parents ever finished high school. Mm. So. Um, so it just happened to be a I university th Well, college, there, there right? was a reason. A friend of my father, uh, Mr. Wood, uh, had some connections with University College, mm -hmm. and he put my name in the hopper, and that may have helped. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't your, your particular choice to go to the godless university and not the God-fearing university? I, if I'd been given the choice, I would have chosen to University College. <laughs> okay. Um, and anyway, it was, a, it was a happy choice. Mm -hmm. The undergraduate work was primarily in chemistry, secondarily in physics, and in fact we had no mathematics in, in college. The only mathematics I've ever had was in high school, and as you heard, I was a relatively undistinguished student in mathematics. Uh, I've managed to get by without anyone discovering my mathematical ignorance uh, <laughs> during the ensuing uh, 50 years. <laughs> anyway, I finished the bachelor's degree, or the bachelor's with honors degree, as it was called. There's first class honors, second class honors, and past degree. Uh -huh. And uh, I was one of three students who got first class honors. Uh, the second one was a longtime friend of mine, Peter Agius, with whom I later toured Europe on a bicycle. Uh, he ended up as a senior scientist at SO, Standard Oil. And uh, the third one was Len Duncanson, uh, who um, had a pretty successful career with ICI in England. Mm -hmm. So those were the type of people that uh, uh, were there at the time. Hmm. Now the usual pattern uh, was if you didn't make the effort, you took graduate work at the same place where you took your bachelor's degree. Now Ingall's son, Keith, later transferred to Oxford and later had a distinguished career in Canada. Uh -huh. And another friend of mine from high school, Mick Barrett, uh, he quickly learnt Latin and he got into Oxford and he end, eventually ended up on the faculty at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So um, that was Stationer's School and University College. Now graduate work was strange because basically Ingold ran the show. Uh -huh. And was he Sir Christopher by then? Or? No, I don't think he was. Mm -hmm. But he, he shortly became it after he'd become president of the Chemical Society. Ah. And so I uh, willy-nilly ended up studying physical organic chemistry. In particular, the kinetics of aromatic sulfonation. However, the graduate training, in retrospect, was pretty bad. I spoke to Ingold no more than four times in three years. Uh. <laughs> and my other co-director was E.D. Hughes, of Hughes and Ingold fame. Mm -hmm. But he was professor at Aberystwyth at the time and came riding down from Bangor on the train mm -hmm. uh, about once a month <laughs> and um, would simply walk in and say, any progress, Davenport? And I'd say, not very much, Mr. K Professor Hughes. And I really got no advice. So you were self-taught, mm -hmm. except from any advice you could get up from senior graduate students. Mm -hmm. How big was the school? It was not 
not very large. There mm -hmm. were probably about 30 of us. Ah, okay. Now, in spite of the fact that I think the graduate education, to put it mildly, was one of benign neglect, um, several of them succeeded in teaching themselves well enough to have decent academic research careers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ron Gillespie was one, yeah. and uh, um, Charlie Bunton, who ended up in California, and two or three who, who worked in England. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, um, I would have been much better off if I'd taken a bachelor's degree in England and come to America to do a PhD. Ah. Because I think their method of training PhDs with coursework and very much hands-on mm -hmm. research direction would have been much better for me. It didn't happen. But while I was finishing up my PhD, um, a, a postdoctorate from a visiting postdoctorate from the United States came, mm -hmm. and this was Joseph Burnett, uh, who uh, had a, a good, fine career in the United States. But at that time, he was on the faculty at Reed's Co Reed College a small liberal arts college in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And uh, he asked me whether I would like to go and work on a Office of Naval Research contract that he had got at Reed College in Oregon. Mm -hmm. As a postdoctoral student? As a postdoctoral yeah. student. And I believe I was the first postdoctoral student that Reed College ever had. Mm. And after they tried me, I don't think they bothered to get another one. <laughs> well, it's uh, primarily an undergraduate school. Right? It is. Uh -huh. And the benefit I got from it was uh, being a colleague of a very small faculty, four of them, Arthur Scott, Joe Burnett, Fred Ayres, who was a mountain climber, and Art Livermore, who eventually ended up at the... Triple uh, AS in in uh, Washington, mm -hmm. but they were all focused mm -hmm. on teaching. The only one who really did substantial research was Joe Burnett, mm -hmm. and he later moved to Brown University, then to North Carolina University. That's right. He was, and then he went back to. Uh, the recently founded University of California at Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. So that is the, Joe Burnett's the person mm -hmm. who brought me to this country. Well, I guess, was it originally, um, did, had you decided to move here or was it just a, a year or two? Uh, for me? It? Yes, for you. Uh -huh. Oh no, I had no intention of doing other than <laughs> seeing the Wild West. Ah. Uh, and so, um, after a year with, with Joe Burnett, uh, unfortunately, the, there were no academic jobs available in England. Mm -hmm. uh, or if they were, they were being competed for by uh, ex-majors in the 8th Army with chestfuls of medals, <laughs> and I couldn't qualify. So Ingold, uh, to my surprise, wrote a letter uh, telling me that Harry Sisler at Ohio State University, that Harry Sisler had a postdoc working in uh, nitrogen chemistry mm -hmm. and Lewis acid base theory. And if I was interested, I should write to him. Well, uh, I did. And I wrote to Harry Sisler, and he accepted me largely in view of Ingold's prestige, mm -hmm. I think. And I spent two uh, very happy, not terribly productive years at Ohio State. It was slowly becoming apparent that original research was not going to be my forte. <laughs> but did you but have... it took mm -hmm. quite a while before I admitted it. Did you have teaching opportunities at all these times? Uh, I was always the 
first one called in to give lectures when people were out of town. Uh -huh. I remember one occasion uh, going to an Air Force base in Dayton, and when I got to the guard post, uh, they said nationality. I said British. They said, "Oh, we're not sure we can let you in." So <laughs> they they went and uh, called the uh, commanding officer. And he apparently said, put him in the hearse. Uh, the hearse was a <laughs> car with cur uh, curtains across the windows. <laughs> and uh, I was driven to the lecture room where I, I uh, indoctrinated the uh, service students with, mm -hmm. with British prejudices. <laughs> and then I was put back in the hearse and shipped out and went back home. Uh, those were the times mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, but I, I got valuable experience, uh, particularly uh, in the classes of Chris Wilson, who was a probably Ingold's smartest student. Mm -hmm. But after World War II, he he came to this country mm -hmm. and eventually set up a, an industrial company in High Point, North Carolina. But Chris Wilson seemed to be out of town a lot, mm -hmm. and so I got to give a lot of lectures, and uh, that was fine by me because I enjoyed lecturing. Even then, I enjoyed mm -hmm. talking, so uh, it worked out fine, and I got good practice. But after two years, um, it was obviously time to move on, there was still nothing much available in England. If there had been, I would have gone back. Mm -hmm. uh, and this so was in looked, 1950. This was 1947, sorry, 1953. 53, okay. Uh, so I looked around and there, there was a job. There weren't too many jobs in this country, mm -hmm. but Michigan advertised Pennsylvania University of Pennsylvania advertised and Purdue advertised. So I wrote to all three and in fact got invited to all three. Oh. Um, Michigan decided after I'd given my talk that I was too frivolous <laughs> because I probably made a joke in the course of my, my lecture and apparently uh, uh, the Wolverines were not ready for jokes. Anyway, uh, University of Pennsylvania um, also offered me a job, but it was clear that you, you had to be independently wealthy uh, <laughs> to accept uh, to the University of Pennsylvania. But a secondary reason was at that time the area around Penn was undergoing urban renewal. Uh, and it looked like London after the Blitz. Mm -hmm. And I'd served in the Civil Defence Force okay. during the Blitz. I knew what rubble looked like. And I, I didn't really want to experience it again. Mm -hmm. So my choice was pretty small. It was Purdue or nothing. So I came to Purdue. I stayed uh, at the downtown hotel. I don't remember whether I gave a talk. I suspect I did. Um, and uh, anyway, I drove over from Columbus here, mm -hmm. looked around. At uh, that time, the department was located in the old Wetherill building. The present Wetherill building has, was being added to at that time. Oh, that's right. Uh, it was being increased mm -hmm. by two-thirds the part that we still think of as the old Wetherill, but in fact, mm -hmm. it wasn't there when I arrived in 53. So the big facade facing south was was not there, that was some of the new part? Huh. No. Huh. no. Uh -huh. So um, the rest of the chemistry operation were in the so-called FWA buildings, Federal, Federal War Authority buildings, <laughs> on the other side of campus. There were five of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, three of them were joined together, FWA 1, 2, and 3, and across the street were 4 and 5. Were these the ones up now where the um, Armstrong building is? Yeah. Uh, okay. No, no, no. Oh, uh, not there. They're, uh, they're over 
uh, close to the physics building. Okay. And indeed, when Weatherall, the enlarged Weatherall opened, mm -hmm. physics took over FWA 4 and 5 uh -huh. for some of their, their work. Okay. But when I went there, uh, Ben Cass's research group was over in FWA. Mm -hmm. uh, so was Bill Johnson's radio chemistry. And all the freshman lec lectures were given in the FWA buildings. Oh, do, was, we, was there a large lecture we, hall? We didn't have room 200 at that time. Uh -huh. oh, that's right. So um, it was really a uh, very early stage of the evolution of the present uh, mm -hmm. how department. Big was, yeah, how big was the department about then? Yeah. Uh, in terms of undergraduates, huge. Well, in terms about of 5,000. Yeah. In terms of faculty? In yeah. terms of faculty, I would say about 15, uh -huh. with a number of people who were brought in uh, more or less on approval by McBee. Mm -hmm. It was a rather arbitrary department head. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they showed some promise, they might get a second year. Otherwise, they were more or less let go. So it was almost like an adjunct faculty position. It was an adjunct faculty position. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think in large part I owed my uh, appointment at Purdue to the influence of Herb Brown. Who was already here at the time. He was already here and he was an inorganic chemist at the time. At the time. <laughs> and uh, he had great respect for Ingold. Mm -hmm. Uh, because he'd been battling over the uh, importance of steric effects in uh, unimolecular eliminations, mm -hmm. subjects on which I later gave a, a, a satirical talk. Yes. <clears throat> but Herb, I think, then as later, was a, a strong voice in the department mm -hmm. uh, and a strong intellectual force in the department. And so <clears throat> I think... Probably it was Herb that tipped the balance in my being given uh, something other than a uh, uh, adjunct faculty appointment. So, so you were part of the regular faculty. So I you? was appointed a regular instructor, mm -hmm. and a couple of years later I was made an assistant professor. Mm -hmm. Now the department obviously was a quite different animal then than it is. It was later, it is now. Mm -hmm. But um, some of the people who really made the department what it became were already in place. Herb Brown being the obvious example, mm -hmm. the most distinguished chemist we've had on the faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, but Ben Kess uh, was uh, already uh, working in silicon chemistry. In, in which he'd made, he ended up making quite a... a well, good he eventually uh, got the uh, the ACS award, the yes. Kipping Award in mm -hmm. Silicon Chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, Nathan Colbloom, a uh, grumpy old man though he was, uh, was doing good work in more or less physical organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, Walter Edgell, a uh, ambitious and rather flamboyant physical chemist, uh, was making certain waves, although uh, he never really developed into the mm -hmm. national name that he was expected to. And then there was a uh, Bill Johnson in radiochemistry. Mm -hmm. So uh, Henry Foyer was already there. He was already there. Okay. Jim Brewster was already on the faculty. Mm -hmm. So many of the people who served Purdue for the next 30 or 40 years were there. Were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, of the ones I mentioned, uh, I don't think any of them, except Bill Johnson, mm -hmm. uh, left. They, right. they were fairly loyal to Purdue. Mm -hmm. Now, McBee was a, uh, a strange man as department head. He was... He was obviously hugely ambitious, uh, but he was also in some ways uh, rather uh, 
uncertain of himself. Mm -hmm. But he, he, he sort of um, hid that with a certain bluster. Mm -hmm. And he had the habit of bypassing the dean and going directly to Havdi. The president. Right. The president, who was a chemical engineer, so he had certain sympathies, perhaps, for chemistry. So McBee could be quite ruthless, and there were quite a number of negative things that could be said, and indeed were said, about his chairmanship. Mm -hmm. He had achieved chairman in part by besting M.G. Mellon, who would, I think, hope to be chairman. <laughs> And Mellon had been there but since Mellon 21. Was a Mellon yes. was a gentleman, mm -hmm. and, uh, and McBee was not. Was not. <laughs> but to give McBee his credit, when he took over Purdue's chemistry department, it was the sort of also ran in the Big Ten, mm -hmm. and for that matter, also ran nationally. But when McBee stepped down, uh, or to put it more bluntly, run out of office. Uh, he and, thanks to his leadership, mm -hmm. it had now become one of the better departments in the Big Ten. And as I seem to remember, we peaked as number 13 in the country. Uh -huh. We're no longer that high. No, no. And so McBee deserves credit for mm -hmm. presiding over and perhaps it was a sign of the times, but I think he deserves credit for the influence he had on the department. And this was in, in, in the encouragement of, uh, of, of graduate uh, work or publications? or uh, Well, it's, it's seen certainly that, not teaching. Seeing that people used. had what they need. Okay. Yeah. As far as I, I know, he never taught. Uh -huh. um, and indeed, I remember one occasion when Herb Brown had set up his own personal seminar, which mm -hmm. wasn't called the, the Brown Seminar, but mm -hmm. we all referred to it as that, mm -hmm. which was in physical organic chemistry, mm -hmm. which was really his area, even though he was an inorganic chemist. And it was a very good seminar, and as an old Ingolf student, I used to attend it regularly. Mm -hmm. And McBee resented this because it was so popular. And eventually he shut it down. Oh dear. Mm. And uh, certainly that uh, didn't please Herb Brown's ego. And furthermore, I think it was a great loss to the department because Herb Brown uh, was a fine teacher, amongst other things. Mm. Mm -hmm. And he used to give the, <coughs> the basic graduate in organic courses, 641, 642. Mm -hmm used a lot of his own research as examples, but that's a pretty good way to do it if you're doing good research. And Herb was a first-rate teacher, but when he became a, a distinguished professor, a research professor, he stopped formal teaching. Mm -hmm. And so there are many people who pass through this department who never heard Herb Brown lecture. And that, that was a tragedy, I think. But Herb had other uh, things in mind, and he achieved most of them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me, uh, I'm, I'm curious, as, as you established yourself, um, and you had, you, you'd you said previously that you had not, uh, you decided that uh, that, that, that uh, high-powered research was not was your metier. was probably not my metier. No. But, uh, but you, you, you consciously chose a, a path um, well, for your own I don't know whether career. I consciously chose it or not. Uh, the fates determined. Uh, there was a course back then um, which was, I think, called 225, 226. And it was for undergraduates in the School of Humanities who were required to take two semesters of physical science. Okay. Mm -hmm. And previously had been taught by rather unsympathetic chemists. Yeah. And the humanities students, to a man and to a woman, hated it. Mm -hmm. And the dean, uh, a man called William Leakey Ayres, was rather fond of this course. 
and he asked McBee if they couldn't come up with somebody who could do a better job. And uh, for whatever reason, I was told, not asked, told, mm -hmm. to teach this course for humanities majors. Well, it, it suited me because I, I was always interested in the humanities. And I taught the course, it was to sophomores, juniors and seniors. Uh -huh. And these were people who already had other majors besides chemistry. So they may, may have been ignorant in science, but they weren't ignorant in other things. So I taught the course in a very broad sense. Uh, in fact, uh, one semester was given over solely to the history of atomism. So oh, this way it was a two semester course? A two semester course. On the laboratory, we actually, I used some of my organic background, and we actually had these students in, uh, in the arts uh, doing original synthesis in organic chemistry. <laughs> now, they, these were uh, fish in a barrel sort of synthesis, yeah. uh, homologous synthesis in a way. Uh, and they also provided compounds for my rather faltering research program. <laughs> but it's not often that uh, humanities students actually make new compounds. Usually it's a lab. So I, I, I did a lot of um, experimentation there. There was a lot of good chemistry there. Mm -hmm. But most of it was given a historical introduction. And furthermore, they had to give write term papers, something which had not been done in undergraduate chemistry courses. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the t topics was to uh, uh, to read Ben Johnson's The Alchemist and write a report on it. Uh, the other, well, there were several others, mm -hmm. the other was uh, uh, Christopher Marlowe, Dr. Faustus. But there, there were others more closely related to science. And the, the students liked it, and particularly the young ladies. Uh, Purdue was a masculine stronghold at that time. But what charming young ladies they were on campus were mainly in the humanities mm -hmm. or in home economics. which uh, And they had to be back in their sorority houses by 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very different times. So I was successful with this course, which definitely pleased the dean. And uh, I think that was <clears throat> what got me set to uh, make a future at Purdue. Mm -hmm. Now at the time, was there a, <coughs> was there a, a chemical education? Um, no. Uh, section? No. Uh -huh. No. It's just the classic divisions. It, it was just the, the classic things. And uh -huh. I taught um, freshman chemistry to the uh -huh. incoming hordes. <laughs> and when Weatherall opened, I moved from FWA 5 to um, room 200. Uh -huh. And often taught three sections, so I would teach a thousand students a semester. I mean, we, we had lots of students, and so it was a big production, and you, I started devising freshman experiments, mm -hmm. which I had a, a certain knack for, mm -hmm. and uh, so I made, made a place in, in freshman chemistry other than being just required to give some lectures, mm -hmm. which was true of most of the rest of the faculty. But to its credit, the senior faculty taught always the, the beginning freshman courses. They didn't fob that off, on, at least not then, not then. on visitors. Uh -huh. So uh, I got a s sort of input into teaching at Ohio State and at Purdue. I'd got a feeling for teaching with historical viewpoints which suited me fine because mm -hmm. I'd always been interested in history. And so, although I didn't know it, my future career was being fashioned at that time. <laughs> now, the emphasis on teaching and teaching teachers uh, was strengthened when 
uh, the NSF started running summer institutes for high school teachers. Yeah, that was something I wanted to ask you about. The NSF and, uh, summer summer institute started uh, well when you were, when you after you were at Purdue. Though they started oh yes, well that says I w I inaugurated the Purdue summer institute, ah. mm -hmm. and I, I ran it. And th this was basically um, we taught three subjects in, during a, a, a eight-week summer school. Mm -hmm. And um, three uh, of the three courses, two were regular PCAM or inorganic chemists, undiluted pretty well, although taught by sympathetic people. And the third one was a, a sort of methods education course. And that was, I think, the beginnings of Purdue's rise, if that's the term, mm -hmm. in the educational area. And this went on for about 10 years. I didn't teach it all those years uh, because I was interrupted by something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was, I think, the beginning of Purdue's concern about high school teachers. So this when it was inaugurated what, in the late 50s or so? Uh, you know, I'm not quite sure. I'd have to check. I mean, you you, you started that before you went to India, though. I think I did, uh -huh. but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Now, you brought up India, so I may as well pick up. Segue into that, yes. Sir. So, um, it all started with taking a, a flyer out of my mailbox. And usually you look at those and toss them in the trash can. Mm -hmm. But this one intrigued me because Purdue had just signed on to participate in the Kampur Indo-American program. This was a program which had been uh, inaugurated in India, at least the IIT.